The reason it's a great film is that it's the first great counterculture film. A lot of people would say Easy Rider is the first great counterculture film, but Easy Rider was too on the nose. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a place where you really can't trust anyone over 30 and you can't trust anyone that lives beyond the city limits. That's sort of where America was going in the 60s. The youth culture didn't just supplant the previous generation, they took over. They wanted to eliminate the previous generation. And so this was the movie that had that violent element. It's just a great pastiche of new things, things that have not been seen before. A lot of people thought that it was a documentary. People were less sophisticated about film at the time, but it was shot that way and edited that way. And from the opening crawl to the very end of it, it was portrayed as something that really happened to the point where today, there are people who believe that it really happened. I was so delighted to read about this portrait of the career of someone who just wanted to be making all the time and to see all of these different kind of perspectives on a filmmaker who's both kind of sort of too famous and not famous enough. And so I really appreciate the work that the book did and that it's part of a bigger culture of interest in Toby Hooper's work as well and the work that horror can do. There's this pure cinematic charge to Toby Hooper's body of work. He loved the idea of cinema being something like music, something that can take you out of your body something immersive and transportive. And I think that's what Toby Hooper's films, when they're at their heights, actually do. It's the kind of indelible images and soundscapes of his movies that stick around. I'll never unsee those kind of foggy, dreamlike, gel-lit scenes from Eaten Alive, for example, or some of those really excessive images from Life Force. Or, of course, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is just this endlessly immersive nightmare. And I think that's something Toby Hooper does better than anybody is translate the kind of language of nightmares to film. I think of his work as a kind of funhouse. <laughs> and a funhouse is where all of these seeming opposites coexist and resonate in strange ways. So that kind of logic of analogy, that language of association, the kind of poetry, visual poetry that we see. I love his set pieces. I think they are so beautifully composed and unsettling. He holds on things a little too long and that is perfect for the amount of tension he builds. His films are legitimately scary and he is funny. I mean, it's a dark humor where you can kind of take a breath because, ah, oh, all right, that's kind of funny, even though it's sick. He is the quintessential smiler with a knife. He's a fist in a velvet glove, especially later in his career when he was having to work in modes that didn't necessarily welcome the kind of social commentary that he was interested in including in his movies. Like Orson Welles, he was trapped by his first major film, which people identified him with and became very stubborn in seeing his other attempts to do different films and television production in his later work. I think a lot of it was misunderstood because he had the impossible standard of the 74 Texas Chainsaw Massacre to follow and he didn't want to do it. The center of his universe when he first started was Austin, which is sort of the sister city of San Francisco when it comes to the arts. And he was a Texas hippie redneck. You know, he, he rivaled Dennis Hopper for the number of times he said the word man when you talk to him. <laughs> and Hooper, of course, was interested in music. Hooper said, I love music and I enjoy creating sounds. I got into making music when I was a child, starting with the spoons and the koto before moving on to the piano. And the koto, just by way of trivia, is 
a 13 string Japanese zither. I find that Hooper is a kind of invisible force in what we might call young adult horror cinema. There's a whole group of directors, including Joe Dante, Tom Holland, and others who are tied into this perspective and life of youth in a pretty troubled America. If there is development for youth in these films, it, it leaves them and us in this kind of moment of entropy where there's really no way out of it. Cooper is obsessed with this kind of idea of an America that's constantly in crisis. And it's constantly in crisis because of our refusal to accept our own history and to acknowledge the, the debt we owe to the others that we have stolen land from, whose livelihood we've taken away, whose culture and memory we've paved over, quite literally. Hooper was never really interested, it seems, in making a film that anybody could just say, I know exactly what I'll be getting with that. And I think that's what makes his filmography so remarkable and so rewarding to revisit. Because you look at any of them, from any of these decades, and he's dipping in and out of various subgenres or themes, different styles. He isn't simply trying to make the same kind of film each time. Outsider films or unloved films or discarded films that are sort of about discard, right? About what we discard. They are sort of abject films in Hooper's catalog that are themselves, I think, about abjection. We live in a nation that prides itself on this constant sense of progress, always moving towards some kind of utopian promise, but there's always a sense of accompanying move towards a nightmare. And I think Hooper was excellent at seeing the ways that beneath American rooftops, we sometimes have this idealized sense, but more often than not, we have a nightmare waiting to come forward. There always seems to be a sense of obsolescence in these characters, lost and no longer useful, and reacting to that shift in violent ways. If you look at the family in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there the factory is closed down. There is no useful purpose for them anymore, and eventually they turn to insularity and cannibalism. Or you look at the eye segment in Body Bags, the main character Brent can no longer play professional baseball. He becomes stifled by domestication, caged in by the baby crib that he's building for his pregnant wife. You know, all of these examples, Texas Chainsaw 2, Chop Top is this sort of parody of free love hippie rhetoric and the sort of shell-shocked damage of, of Vietnam. Leatherface becomes a arrested adolescent boy attempting to express himself sexually in unwholesome ways. The obsolete doesn't just disappear, right? It resurfaces or, you know, it can still be stumbled upon. On the one hand, in Hooper's films overall, it seems like stumbling upon the past is never a good thing. And yet, we stumble upon the past, perhaps because it's unresolved or because it's it's misunderstood. And so I think we leave things for dead before they're really dead. And when we do that, we create that lack of resolution that causes these things to come back. And I think it makes it an interesting overall allegory for say, US history generally. We're always kind of seeing the return of the past. We change laws and we create this kind of legal equity and then we like call the task done. And what I think Hooper's films tell us is that you can't just call these things done. You can't just redirect the road. You can't just pass the law. You can't just build over the burial, <laughs> build over the burial ground. So long as they are not dealt with, these things will continue to come back again and again. A profound sense of disappointment, of disillusionment in his work that feels to me both of the contemporary moment, but also really different than the way that a lot of that disillusionment gets funneled into violence and a complaint. I think there's still somehow weirdly, I want to say a kind of sweetness at the heart of spontaneous combustion that is negotiated in a really kind of complicated way. And maybe that's part of the brilliance of someone like Brad Dourif as an actor. But I think that there's a demand that Cooper places on the claims of the American dream or the American nightmare, a real insistence on that that is different than 
a lot of the ways that those claims are often made by people who feel like they're the rightful inheritors of the American dream. There's something more generous and more demanding at work in the kind of vision that Hooper has and that he creates. The real despair that comes through that film that's somehow not nostalgic at the same time. And that's an unusual combination. He uses developments in politics and economics in, in the Reagan era as a springboard to comment on the destructive, rapacious nature of 1980s capitalism and consumerism. Not necessarily anything new for Hooper, but I think he's reaching or was reaching an audience with those films that he wasn't with his earlier movies. These three films, Invaders from Mars, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, Life Force, they have the patina of mainstream commercial entertainment, but if you scratch the surface just a little bit, you can see that commentary underneath. And there weren't many videos at the time, and so those that were hits were played on high rotation. We know Idol was a, a fan of the Chainsaw Massacre and wanted Hooper. Dancing with myself, that could have gone any number of ways, but what Hooper did brings this deep horror aesthetic to it where the crowd wanting to consume the celebrity and the celebrity at one level being willing to play that game and yet as another saying, no, I'm above all of this, which is quite fun. I was really interested in seeing how Toby Hooper appropriated aspects of the American Gothic tradition, most particularly what William Burroughs said about America and of course the old dark house tradition, which Toby obviously knew quite a lot about in terms of the what I would say, dysfunctional light from the city on the hill. The home is kind of the space of family, work, and death. That's literalized in a film like Mortuary, but it's also literalized in a film like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where the home is also an abattoir and also a place where all things come <laughs> to die and to be reduced to their animality. The main attraction of Toby Hooper's cinema is the house, which is also, remember, the center of capitalism, where people were trying to rethink the family, rethink how to be together in a house. He's made statements about the dinner scene in Texas Chainsaw Massacre as being about a kind of repudiation of those kind of normative family relations. So if you go through his films, The Fun House and Salem's Lot and Poltergeist and all the way to Toolbox Murders, which is an amazing movie, by the way. Not only the house, the way the house is dressed. The dressing is just so brilliant and it adds a texture of tactility to our experience. He kind of immerses us in the experience of trauma. I was interested in Poltergeist for a number of reasons. One is because it is so often attributed to Steven Spielberg instead of Toby Hooper. Just because Spielberg produced it doesn't mean that he shot it. It just doesn't have his sensibility. I guarantee you Steven Spielberg had no time to ghost direct Poltergeist. He was doing other things. If, if this was an episode of Forensic Files, we could prove by Steven Spielberg's schedule that he did not ghost direct Poltergeist. You know, if that's the only way that we can end up getting rid of that myth. Poltergeist is not only a masterpiece, but it's his masterpiece. While it's true that it looks a lot like a Spielberg film, I think that that's part of the interest of it because it lures you in thinking that it's going to be a much safer film than it is. And instead of which you find yourself really quickly enmeshed in a lot of the darker themes that haunt Toby Hooper throughout his career. So you have this horrible, horrible suburban subdivision that is built on the land of a cemetery. And the developers have told people that it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. We moved the cemetery. It deals a lot with the kind of odd isolation that people put themselves in. So this idea of moving out to the suburbs that was to be with people of your own class and kind and I think there was this feeling like especially in the 50s and 60s people would be having you know these little neighborhood get-togethers because you were all the same tribe and in fact what people found was that they moved into heavy-duty isolation to have a middle class is not just that there are problems about the middle class that it's sterile that it's disorienting that it removes you from the real concerns of life but the thing that particularly worries him is that there has to be a lower class and then the question the question always comes, how long are they going to peacefully stay buried underground before there is some kind of rising up and demanding of accounts? 
being an American now for 40 years, I realize what a nasty place it can be as opposed to the images which have beamed to us when we're in Britain and elsewhere. We're looking at kind of the real, um, <laughs> the real America, the rot at the center of the real America, bubbling sewage sludge in a, a landscape that seems like it can't grow anything but tombstones and factories and power lines and on the verge of apocalypse where everything's about to tip over in a a very cosmic way. What are we like? What are Americans like? What, what is it about our curiosity, our drive for success, our drive for great wealth or position? What is it about us that fuels that? And why haven't we learned yet that sometimes that drive can lead to ugliness in our behavior, cruelty towards others and violence? This is a theme that recurs throughout Toby Hooper's filmography in that he's often destabilizing customary ways of thinking about or seeing, especially American culture, but I would, I would argue um, human and anthropocentric culture more largely. Both films deal with the triune brain theory or the lizard brain theory to explore or destabilize ideas around human exceptionalism, showing these manifestations of the lizard brain swallowing human characters whole. He said shortly after this, uh, the making of The Mangler, that in terms of my career, I might have been better off if I was the son of a bitch people expected me to be. And I think that The Mangler is very much filled with that kind of anger and that kind of ferocity. This is in some ways a culmination in Hooper's career that looks at the process of his preceding 20 years in Hollywood and primarily looks at Hollywood as this machine, the might even say the Hollywood industrial complex as a very complicated and tumultuous entity. That sensibility is something that's not just about horror anymore. Or it's not just about sort of expressing this through the lens of the genre film. Instead, it's something that is uh, actually, I think, quite personal. We see so much of what was at the heart of his artistry, which is a remarkable production design. This laundry machine is this really grotesque, again, dimpled thing that expands across the entire floor of the laundromat and truly gruesomely consumes several people throughout the film. I think this film has some of the most heinous <laughs> scenes in all of Hooper's filmography. Toolbox Murders is a underexplored gem. It's a strange film. And I think that's why I like it. It is, for the first half, a slasher. And then in the second half, it does this 180 and it becomes this gothic woman's film. And he's making all kinds of references to, I think, avant-garde films of the 20s and 30s especially. It's definitely one of those strange places where it seems bigger on the inside than on the outside, but it's also big on the outside. It's looming. And one of the things that's so striking about it is the film has a townhouse hidden within the walls. And that's where the killer's lair exists. And many of his films feature that kind of idea that there's a space within a space. In Poltergeist, when all hell breaks loose, literally, and the closet opens up and there's a whole new dimension. And in Texas Chainsaw, in the various dining room scenes, there's that kind of door that opens up and horrible things come out of it. Toolbox Murders is really about Toby Hooper's ambivalence about being in Hollywood and how he really wanted to make it, how after he made the incredible Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he was really trying to break into Hollywood. And for like an entire decade, he didn't have final cut in any of his films, which really impinged on Cooper's creativity. I think one of the things that I really enjoyed with this project was revisiting a filmmaker who has made a film that for me, as for so many people, remains maybe the most frightening film ever. A film that has shown up in my dreams running like a film in real time and feeling in real time like it's going to be completely inescapable in a way that no other movie ever has. You know, if you look at a character like Sally, who ends up becoming so incredibly marked by the experience that we can't even read her final reaction as any one response. We have hysteria, but we have hilarity and terror and relief and all of these mixed emotions in it. I was probably too young to see it and it was a midnight screening, pretty much changed my life. 
And I think I've seen the film 20 times and I still see new things in it. These odd adjacencies, these strange abutments within the film. Suddenly we have the announcement of a police authority and then we have a drunken prophet in a graveyard foretelling the future, a promise to deliver the annals of American history. All the sort of cinematic basics are kind of upended and up for grabs. That's why people are celebrating it 50 years later. There's nothing like it. It set the tone for so many other films. It's a work of art. This is a movie that blew me away, like in every way, and I think that it is the most effective horror film ever made. Why is it so scary? <laughs> it's broad daylight. And I thought, that's brilliant, right? And so when I see films like that now, I'm like, thank you, Toby Hooper. You showed us all how to do that. That's brilliant. The guy has it all. He should be respected. Nobody thought of Toby Hooper as having a body of work. He was considered a journeyman. He should be studied as an auteur. He was an auteur. The ways in which some of the kind of devalued qualities of these films have now kind of circled back. Something I'd love to see more of is continued restoration and release of Hooper's films and, and television episodes on streaming platforms and in physical media. The ongoing projects of a high definition restoration of many of his films have revealed to a lot of critics just how beautiful his films are, just how technically accomplished and how narratively and thematically complex they can be. The television work that Hooper did is something that I had hoped we could cover more thoroughly. He was hired to direct no fewer than three pilots for series, and you don't hire someone to direct a pilot when you're not confident that their vision could carry your whole show. Maybe it's also a bit of the Hooper brand that people were looking for, sort of like, this will give us an edge, but I also think it's the Hooper sensibility. It's a political sensibility, and it's an aesthetic sensibility. So I would like to see a lot more done on the television work. One of the things that would really drive my interests would be to understand more about Hooper's international reputation, to see what kind of filmmakers outside of the United States are drawing on Hooper's influence. Biographical details and dimensions of his life and work and how that shaped some of this sort of rocky terrain and trajectory of, of his career because I think he, in the American context, has one of the most fascinating careers because he was working both inside and outside of the system almost throughout it and could never quite find any kind of stable footing for more than one or at most two films at a time. The thing that the critical studies don't take into consideration so much is the business side. All of those things affect the final product and they have to start taking into consideration the technology of the time. The world that Toby Hooper lived in when he made all of his films doesn't exist today. Uh, what I'd actually like to see more of is a consideration of his work in the context of some of his fellow horror directors. So these are filmmakers that he's often associated with, people like Wes Craven and George A. Romero. There's a real discounting of the movies by these filmmakers that came later in the 1980s, in the 1990s, in the early 2000s. Instead, there's a tendency to focus on their radical work from the 1970s and the connections between those films. More of this somewhat different way of doing horror criticism, more focused, more performative, in some ways less critical distance, right? Like being really trying to be as involved in what's going on as possible. I think there's a lot of room left for Texas Chainsaw Massacre criticism, just a new kind of criticism, especially considering some of the areas that Huber is so beautifully attentive to, like uh, when it comes to his interiors, his spaces. So let's have an architect sit down with a scholar who works on the ecology of space. Of course, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist have gotten plenty of attention, as they should. But I think we could use a book on Salem's Lot. Salem's Lot is brilliant. I don't think anything comes close to Toby Hooper's version of Salem's Lot. I think we could use a book on the 2000s films, Toolbox Murder and Mortuary or Gin. The way should be open to look at that last film of Toby Hooper, get it available and see what he was trying to do there. If we look at it properly and if we explore and if we interrogate. I think we could use a book on certainly the Funhouse uh, and his work with Canon. I'd also love to see an academic biography exploring his background in experimental cinema. 
cinema, his interactions with countercultural movements, and his later work as a fiction writer as well. I'd like to see more people get into uh, Toby Hooper's novel, which he wrote with Alan Goldshire, Midnight Movie, which is a really interesting early digital media novel that kind of predicted the troll culture that the social media metaverse fostered. There hasn't been the kind of critical attention paid to him that there has been to people like John Carpenter or George Romero, where you know their whole work, or at least large parts of their work, are treated seriously and analytically and with care. And like I said, this is the first book to do that, and I'm hoping that it is the first book to do that and therefore more will be coming. So let's get to those drive-in totals. We've got two breasts, innumerable dead bodies, lengthy analysis of suggestively shaped utensils, if you know what I mean and I think you do. Not one, but two full-length essays on The Mangler, extensive chainsaw foo, Peter, Paul, and Mary foo, intertextuality foo, triune brain theory foo, abjection foo, and a whole lot of overthinking it. So four stars. Joe Bob says, check it out. What is triune brain theory? That's a new one.